I'd like to thank you all for joining us today at the Argyle Digital CISO Leadership Forum. Today, I'm here to talk to you about the cloud security risks, rewards, and readiness. My name is Reese Pittman, and I, as Tiffany mentioned, I'm a cloud security architect with Cloud by McKinsey. And in the nearly two decades of working in cybersecurity, half of that being in cloud, I've noticed some similar patterns that have surfaced between organizations as they strive to adopt their security program to operating in the cloud. Some have been successful and some have struggled a little bit. And I'm here to bring that to you today, what I've seen to help you improve your security program as you adopt the cloud, transition to the cloud, or continue operating in the cloud, wherever you are in your cloud journey. I would like to say that this whole event is actually titled Defending Home Base in an Increasingly Automated World. And you may have heard the phrase, the best way is to fight fire is with fire. Well, the TLDR is, the secret to fighting automation is with a little bit more automation. And we're gonna get into that. I just would like to preface this with a little bit. There's gonna be some things in here that are hopefully should be very, very obvious, but they're worth repeating again, just to make sure that we're all on the same page. And I'm actually hoping that, that you watching today are sitting here going, yes, we know this, please move on. And even those who are watching the video later on. There's also gonna be a little bit of tactical, and then we're also going to include a little bit of theoretical or philosophical ways to approach increasing our security posture in our organization and bringing everyone else all into our security program. The first thing we want to start off with is no FUD. Now, this should be obvious. As security practitioners, we should be probably tired of hearing FUD from our vendors or from other media organizations, et cetera. But we all know the FUD is fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And the reason why we don't want to keep preaching FUD both internally and externally is because the longer it takes for a significant breach to happen, or even if it does happen and it's not publicized broadly, widely, or widely internally or externally, your internal teams and partners in your organization become desensitized to the potential of a security breach or risk. They become less vigorous about adhering to policy and they also tend to look for ways to get around policies or procedures, also kind of like what's known as shadow IT. So if we don't preach about FUD, what do we talk about? Well, let's focus on what we call FAB, features, advantages, and benefits. As you increase your security program to a more cloud-centric approach, you're actually going to help your organization increase their agility, their ability to innovate, and hopefully allow them to focus on your business differentiators, which is probably some of the reasons you're actually trying to go to the cloud in the first place. And security is a key component into making that happen. So let's focus on features, advantages, and benefits and forget the FUD. Instead of reporting something like, oh, well, we fixed 10 vulnerabilities in our Keystone application, let's rephrase that internally when we're talking to both leadership as well as our individual contributors by saying, the security team has patched a significant security hole in our flagship application or our most customer reaching application or has our most customer sensitive data application that could have exposed hackers to hundreds of gigabytes of personalized customer data or other sensitive information, potentially causing us hundreds of millions of dollars in financial loss or risk. So again, forget the FUD, focus on the FAB. A way to structure the way we look at our cloud security program, I've defined into five pillars that we're going to discuss today. The first of them being foundational security, identity and access management, detection, response, and traceability, automation, and our team and talent. When we start off with foundational security, since the dawn of time, every great structure that has ever been built has had a solid foundation beneath it to keep it up, standing upright, and being sufficient enough to fulfill its duties. And this is no different for your security organization. When we think about the foundational security, we're thinking about the building blocks, the guardrails, the tools and services, and all of the standardized security components that you want to bring to your organization in a fixed, repeatable, addressable manner. In our foundational security, one of the top things we want to think about is our security maturity. And this is something that you should be trying to adopt immediately after this conversation we have today. When we try to evaluate security maturity, 
we're looking to evaluate our security program and the different components of it from we, no plan to a plan to implemented to fully automated. And when we do this, this allows us to surface the where we need to focus our attention on in our security program. Because at the end of the day, like I said, the only way to fight automation is with more automation. Additionally, in our foundational security component, we want to look at our organizational hierarchy. And that's how we divvy up the different pieces of our organization, specifically in the cloud. And this could be different than the way your org chart is in your organizational documentation, et cetera. But what's important here is to divide our organization, categorize and group our organizations in ways that allows us to apply security programmatically. Some of the technical components and more prescriptive things that we're going to see in our foundational security are things such as landing zones with built-in guardrails. And these guardrails can come in the way of encryption standards, backup and restore policies and procedures, network connectivity requirements. And some of the built-in guardrails could be delivered through infrastructure as code with reusable modularized securely configured infrastructure as code or IAC, we can empower our application teams and our business units to be self-service, allow them to innovate quicker than ever before. And this removes the undifferentiated heavy lifting from the whole application infrastructure procurement and deployment procedures, allowing your business teams to focus on clearly the things that differentiate your business. Additionally, in our foundational layer, we want to look at our isolation, and this includes the network, our account isolation, our different compute segment isolation, and even our application isolations. And finally is the tools and services that we use to either provide to our application teams to use or for our security teams to leverage to either enforce the security, check the security, and also remediate the security in our organization and in our cloud position. Now, when we talk about tools, Tools should be not one tool to fix them all. It could be one tool to solve a particular challenge. It could be multiple tools. But when you're evaluating your tools, you want to make sure that A, the most important thing that your tools provide you is a robust API interface. And this is because without the API, you're not going to be able to facilitate the automation that you need to keep up with the pace of cloud. Additionally, you want to make sure your tools cover the entire spectrum of our security detection and response capabilities. And this means both static and dynamic checks, preventative checks, detective checks, and then of course, corrective actions and checks as well. And once your tool covers these aspects, as well as having the robust API, you're way better suited and positioned to develop a self-service automated security program that removes some of the repeatable everyday tasks from your security team, allowing them to scale with your organization, as well as increases the time that your application teams or your lines of businesses can bring value back into your organization. When we think about putting up guardrails and restrictions in our organization, this is very important and critical, right? Guardrails are good. However, we wanna leave room for exceptions. Security as code is all about giving our folks the freedom to do the work while ensuring we have visibility into what they're doing so there aren't any hidden behaviors or shadow IT. Restrictions and protections are good, but we want to make room for exceptions. In other words, have standards. So for example, I've seen organizations say, we're only going to use tools from the AWS marketplace or the Azure marketplace. And that's a fantastic place to start. However, don't limit yourself by looking only in that one place. If you do, you could be missing out on startups or potentially open source tools where they don't have the team, the budget, or even the relationship to be part of those programs. And they may be the optimal tool for the challenge you're trying to solve. Traditionally in the data centers, we looked at security from a perimeter perspective, firewalls, edge you know, protections and limitations. And there are other folks out there who say, well, identity is the new perimeter, especially when we're looking at the cloud. So your identity and access management is one of the most critical components to protecting your cloud workloads and building your security program in the cloud. Now, when we think about identity and access management, of course, we have some common things. And these are in the category of 
Yes, we know this, and hopefully you want me to move on fast, but we're going to repeat them because they're that important. Least privilege, separation of duties. With all the log data that we have that can tell us exactly what our engineers are doing in our cloud environments, it's really, really easy to pare down our permissions and scope to a least privileged model. But we have to be proactively looking at those logs to actually implement this type of security layer. And then separation of duties. It can be kind of difficult in the cloud, especially with smaller teams or limited technical talent to give the permission sets required to operate functionally to more than one individual. But again, if we're looking at the logs and we're looking at who can do what, then we can be retroactive and prevent privilege or scope creep going forward in our organization. So there's the common recommendation of, well, whoever writes the checks shouldn't be allowed to cash the checks. Well, why can't we apply that same sort of mentality to our identity and access management? The individuals that create the policies and give the permissions probably should not be the ones who could also assume them. Additionally, when we talk about permission management, we wanna talk about our add, move and change automation. And this is very, very critical in what leads to oftentimes the amount of permissions or access that's required for potentially a malicious insider or compromised credentials to do the damage where you weren't expecting it to occur. Now, this is commonly referred to as permission creep or permission scope creep when an individual moves from one organization to another within your company and keeps the same permissions they had before. Additionally, when you hire new talent, whether they're engineering teams, operational teams, security teams, they're excited to join your organization. They wanna hit the ground running, they wanna contribute, they wanna show you that you made a great choice in selecting them. And if it takes two or three weeks or even a month to get them all the permissions they need, where do you think that excitement goes? Unfortunately, it tends to wither away as time goes on. I'm not saying there's not gonna still be a valuable contribution to your organization, but that, that excitement and that energy that they have by joining you can potentially slip through the fingers. And then finally, when we talk about ad move and change, what's really, really important here is the lever scenario. When someone leaves your organization, are you making sure that you remove all the permissions that they have? And I've seen organizations, multinationals, large corporations that should have security locked down where someone leaves and they still have access to the production source code. And I think we all know that that's not the most ideal scenario. The next three things are a little bit more challenging, but thanks to the cloud, the cloud has make, made them easier to accomplish than they've ever been before, especially in our data centers. First one being just-in-time provisioning. This is mostly towards our production accounts where we wanna reduce the amount of people who have access, but at times we need to give them the access to make changes, do investigations, or otherwise maintain our production instances or systems. So the just-in-time provisioning allows us to grant those credentials needed to perform that particular task in near real-time fashion. And you're probably looking at me saying, well, you know, our SOC needs to have access to these items all the time, or they, you know, they need to be able to respond immediately. And I would like to say that with the right automation and the right configurations in place with a little bit of forethought ahead of time, you could actually grant the permissions needed before you're done reading this slide. Secrets, credentials, user passwords, et cetera. Besides security misconfiguration, which is probably one of the most common risks or areas where cloud workloads are compromised, secrets are the next biggest attack vector. Whether they're your short lifespan token credentials, their usernames and passwords, or other types of credentials used to access your environment, such as certificates or tokens of some sort. Managing these secrets in an automated fashion ideally auto-generated, and at best if possible, where a human never actually even knows them, are some of the ideal criteria that you're trying to meet when you're managing secrets in your cloud environment. Now, when I say no human needs to know them, clearly that doesn't include usernames and passwords. However, the usernames and passwords are not necessarily the credentials that we use to access our cloud environments. We should be using short lifespan credentials, such as in renewable, and short-term life lived token credentials. And that allows us two benefits. A, if the credentials that access the cloud environment are ever compromised, they're only gonna last for a very short amount of time and they're easily revocable 
without interrupting another human or engineer's daily operations. Additionally, we can actually take away some of the complex password requirements, such as we need to change our password every 90 days. We can extend that out to something that's much easily more digestible by your entire organization as a whole to something like 365 days or potentially even longer. With the cloud comes a ton of information. A deluge of log data will be pouring into your repositories for you to consume, act upon, and use to otherwise administer and maintain your cloud security organization. So one of the other pillars we have is the detection, response, and traceability. And when we're thinking about detection, response, and traceability, we want to ask ourselves, how fast can we? And we're asking ourselves, how fast can we make our data usable? Or how fast can we initiate change in our organization based on an alert or incident? Or how fast can we determine what happened, where it happened, and who does it impact in our org? Steve Schmidt, the CISO of AWS said, bring in the business and application owners early. You don't want to debate about when to pull the cord that isolates everything in the heat of battle. And the way you're gonna do that is by making your data usable so you can determine what happened, where it happened, and who it affected as fast as possible. Some of the technical components that you are gonna to use to make that doable is A, as we mentioned earlier, your organizational hierarchy. How do you have your different teams, your lines of businesses separated logically in the cloud? Are you using appropriate tagging standard? Do you have a, a pertinent data classification standard that is understandable by everyone in your organization? And then you can actually quantify these timing responses through the use of tabletop exercises and other game day type activities. Now, the core of this entire conversation we're having here today is about automation. It's been known for over a decade or longer. Gardner has been telling us that the cybersecurity field has a shortage of qualified personnel for across the globe, both you know, locally in the US as well as across the globe. I think the US number last time was somewhere near a quarter of a million unqualified or need, need for qualified professionals. Um, when it comes to how do you scale your team to meet up with the speed of the rest of your organization, the answer is automation. And that is one of the most significant parts of your security program that you really need to focus on. That's why it is the end of your security maturity evaluation. And it's the focus of how you think about your tools, how you think about addressing problems, how you think about standardizing your organization. Security through code is all about repeatability. We implement automation and use of code for security purposes because it applies universal rigor throughout the organization. It solves the issue of human error, and that is the common denominator across most cloud breaches. When we're looking at automation, some of the things we're trying to accomplish is, besides security as code, some may call it policy as code. And this goes back to our foundational security where we're implementing our infrastructure as code. Do we have security defined in a code-like format that says this can happen or this cannot happen? And then do we have mechanisms to prevent that, that infrastructure from deploying with that are less than desirable configurations? And or can we detect when infrastructure is deployed with less than desir desirable configurations? Ideally, we're preventing it from ever happening, but we can't assume that it's never gonna happen. So we wanna make sure that we can detect it if and when it does. The same way we treat our infrastructure deployment is the same way we wanna treat our application code. We wanna have gated code deployment. This is commonly referred to as shifting left in our organizational structure for security, all right? And what are we doing? As soon as someone commits their code into whatever our repository of choice is, are we doing a static analysis on that code? Well, we should be. Then what's the next step? You typically wanna build it, test it for load, test it for user acceptance, maybe regression. Well, why are we doing security testing at the same time? We could be doing both dynamic and interactive security testing at this point. And then even when we release to production, we don't necessarily want to test in production, but we want to be monitoring for malicious behavior, malicious activity, either through log data or through telemetry data sent from an agent on the compute instance where your application resides. 
all of this should look something around the basis of action-based detection. These are your standard CRUD operations, create, read, update, delete. And once you're monitoring those, then you can get a holistic picture of what's happening in your organization, know what's good and bad because you've tagged it, know what's sensitive, know what's at risk, and know what the big concern is. Then you wanna follow that up with auto remediation. The ability to take a ticketing pipeline and all the way finish out to fixing whatever the issue is. So take the common example of an S3 bucket exposed to the world, right? Do you really need an engineer to go in there and say, click, 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 let me not let this bucket be public anymore? Well, there's a very robust, robust API around that S3 bucket. There's really no reason why we can't do that with just submitting a ticket and approving it to be done. Again, one of the other things in, in for automation is we can enable our organizations to have no standing access to our production environment. And if you have to worry about PCI, this should be a big booming light that says, yes, we want to do this, help us know how. The answer is through automation. It goes back to the identity and access management. Do you have just-in-time provisioning? Can you give the credentials to someone to act upon just when they need it? Because if you can, then they, nobody ever really needs to be in production. All of your log data comes to you so fast in near real time that you can make your decisions, trigger actions based on this data without needing a human to physically go in there and do something. And then finally, we want to talk about teams and talent. And when we're talking about teams and talent, we're really talking about resourcing, upskilling, and reskilling. And in your organization, you want to think about the different teams you have that you need to partner with. Does security end at IT? No. Is compliance a legal problem or a security problem? Well, it's both. Is, do, is securing the people the job of HR? Sort of, but not really. At the end of the day, it's our security organization that's responsible for this. But we don't have direct contacts or direct influence in these organizations. So how do we get that sort of influence and build those relationships? Well, we do that by building bridges. We want to look for a partner in our organization that can help us in, that, in, the, in the partner organization that can help us bridge those gaps, bring information to us, tell us about the challenges that we have to solve and want to accomplish. You know, and then when it comes to just resourcing individuals, I'd like to ask you a question. When was the last time you created an open position for an entry-level candidate in your organization? I pay attention to these all the time because I know people who are saying, I'd really like to get into security, but no one wants to hire me because I don't have any experience. And I'd like to give you just a small story on this topic about someone who was a roadie in a band. This is a person who lifted speakers all day long, traveled all around the world, helping bands set up. And they were bored, of course, during times when the band was playing or downtime, et cetera. So they would want to get online, but this was before Wi-Fi was available everywhere. So what they did is they learned how to crack Wi-Fi passwords. And today they're the VP of red teaming for one of the most prestigious pen testing organizations in the world that actually manages the security for a nation state. So the point here is don't always assume that someone needs to be a PhD or have all of these certificates. There are a lot of talents that people have that can translate well into your organization and investing in these people now could be one of the best investments you make for your security organization and your team and talent. And finally, I just want to talk about one small thing about creating the culture of security in your organization. Creating the culture of security is ideally trying to get everyone in your organization to say, yes, security is our top priority. Security is most important to us. And not only that, but they feel empowered to be proactive about security incidences, security events, and other security risks or concerns that they may encounter every day in their job. And the way you go about this is by telling them directly, you are critical to our security. You are very important to our security. Forget about the FUD, remember the FAB, and show them that with your help, this is all that we've accomplished so far. We've, we've provided this many prevent breaches. We've fixed you know, 5,000 phishing campaigns that have only had one people click on it. Um, we've also done lunch and learns. They're pretty common, but they're mostly technical audiences. Have you thought about doing these for your non-technical audiences? Are you rewarding people for their good behavior? Are you rewarding people for their ability to bring security events to your attention? 
all the swag, gamification, rewards, these are all fun things that leave a lasting impression for your organization. And when I say lasting, people have fun with this. I'm just gonna wrap up with this one little story about, I know an organization that as a reward for diving deep, they give a full size helmet of a diver's helmet to someone as a reward. And these sit on their desks. You cannot miss this walking past someone's desk and know that they received that recognition. It's, it's huge, it's kind of comical, but it's a big deal and people love these things. So think about how you can apply those to your organization. And with that, I'm gonna go back to Tiffany for our q and I'd like to thank you all so much for joining us here today. Again, my name is Reese Pittman. Have a wonderful day. Thank you so much, Reese. We have a ton of questions, so I want to make sure that we get to at least a few of them. And remember that you can still submit questions in the Q&A chat. Okay, so let's start with the first question. How do you define readiness in cybersecurity? Well, if we refer back to the foundational security and the evaluation of security maturity, depending on where you're at is really how ready you are. Now, of course, we can't all be there at the end goal from the get-go. That's why we have multiple steps to review in our phases. Are we implemented? Do we have automation? Is it documented? Is it well communicated? Those are the things you want to think about, about what parts of your organization you want to pay attention to. Great. Thank you so much, Reese. Moving on to the next question. What are some of the foundation elements of a hybrid IT environment? When you say hybrid IT environment, I'm going to assume you're referring to both cloud and data center. And in the end of the day, we what we do in the data center doesn't necessarily translate into the cloud, but the foundational aspects of things really stay the same. We want to make sure that repeatable tasks can be repeated. We want to make sure that our partner teams are empowered to help themselves. And we want to make sure that our data is protected, encryption is in place, our standards are well-defined and well-delivered. And then again, we want to make sure that we have all the access we need and everyone is involved in contributing to the security program. Thank you so much, Reese. Moving on to the next question, which is safer, a hybrid model or fully cloud? There's no answer to this question of which is safer. It all comes down to, the, I, I could be the classic person that says, well, it depends. And it really comes down to your implementation. So it does depend on your implementation. It depends on your team, it depends on your strengths. If your organization is not quite ready for the cloud and you move too fast, you could potentially be introducing a significant amount of risk. However, if you have gaps in your organization in the data center, moving to the cloud could remove some of these by taking advantage of some of the shared responsibility models, some of the tooling that's available to cloud native solutions, as well as the automation and the other types of repeatability and modularized functions that we mentioned earlier to enable and protect your cloud workloads. So to answer your question, it's, there is no real answer to that. It's really about what choices you make in building your security program and are you driving in the right direction? And if you follow some of the guidelines in the foundation that we look, talked about today, then you'll be heading in the right direction.